for the central bank in a country or in a shared economy uh, is the regulatory bank that also acts as sort of a bank for banks. And so what they control directly is something that's called base money or sometimes high powered money. In the United States, we call it the monetary base. Uh, and it's legal tender, right? So it has to be accepted as payment by law. And it includes both currency, so the cash and coins that you have, and also what are called bank reserves. And so the central bank is the only one that can create legal tender and they can create it uh, sort of at the push of a button. So when we talk about central banks printing money, they're not uh, literally printing money, they are creating uh, more reserves. And reserves are sort of deposits that banks have with the central bank. Um, in the United States, the central bank is called the Federal Reserve System, right? So well, it's about 100 years old, it's founded in 1913. Uh, it's made up of both 12 regional banks around the country, as well as the Board of Governors in Washington, DC. And it's set up so that it is at least semi-independent of the political process. Uh, so uh, governors serve 14 year terms. Um, the uh, presidents are elected by their member presidents of the regional banks are elected by their member banks. Um, and there's sort of a, a rotating um, membership in the Federal Open Market Committee, which is the committee that actually sets uh, the policy rate, which we'll talk about uh, in a minute. So the Federal Reserve does a number of things. It sets reserve requirements. Now reserve requirements uh, are how much banks have to keep of their deposits, either as currency or as reserves, um, and then they're allowed to lend out the rest, right? So when you deposit $1,000 into the bank, they may only have to keep, say, 10% of that or $100 in order, uh, and then they can take the other $900 and make a loan. And so this is how they make a profit. Uh, the Federal Reserve also acts as the lender of last resort through something called the discount window. Um, and as we will see, it also targets something called the federal funds rate and the uh, that is the interest rate at which banks lend each other um, federal funds, which are just uh, reserves. So as opposed to base money or high powered money, we can think of uh, bank money. So bank money is not necessarily uh, legal tender. Um, it's a liability to the bank, not an asset, but it's created by the bank when it takes deposits and makes loans. Uh, so this is how a bank makes a profit, right? They're going to earn interest on those loans, pay a lower interest on the deposits, and that's how they make a uh, profit. Uh, we can also think of broad money as equal to base money minus reserves plus uh, bank money. So in the United States, broad money, as we'll see, we'll think about something like M1, uh, which includes currency, checking accounts, and traveler's checks. Um, but does not include reserves. So if we're talking about the US specifically, the monetary base uh, is bank reserves and currency. It's controlled by the Fed through open market operations, which is when the Fed buys or sells uh, usually treasury bills, sometimes other assets in exchange for bank reserves. So they can increase or decrease the amount of bank reserves in the system. Uh, M1 is our most common measure of the money supply. Uh, it's currency, checking accounts, which are sometimes referred to as demand deposits and traveler's checks. It's the most liquid, meaning it's the most easily used to buy things. Uh, or M2, which includes M1 plus a whole bunch of other banking accounts, savings accounts, money market accounts, and time deposits, where all, which are also known as certificates of deposit. As we'll see in a minute, uh, M2 is uh, sort of more stable than M1, especially uh, over the last financial crisis. So here we have them graphed on the same axis. You can see M2 is, is not surprisingly significantly bigger than M1 since M1 is included in M2. Um, we had a huge jump in the monetary base. So that's the red line here. And you can see it went from about $900 billion to about four trillion dollars um, and that was through something called quantitative easing which we'll talk about more when we talk about monetary policy. Uh, M1 increased substantially as well um, and increased you know faster than it had been increasing from say 2000 to 2008 uh, whereas M2 while it did increase a little bit faster 
uh, is much more steady in terms of how fast it has gone. If we, we can see the changes a little bit better if we put M2 on the right uh, axis, so we have a different scale here on the right-hand axis, and we put M1 and the monetary base on the left-hand axis. And you can see there was a big jump in that monetary base because what the Federal Reserve did was basically start buying a whole bunch of other assets uh, from the banks, and then the banks were paid with reserves. That increased the monetary base, and a lot of people worried that that would increase inflation. You can see it did increase M1 fairly substantially, although not quite as much as the monetary base increase, but it didn't increase M2 by as much. Um, and a lot of that money just sort of sat in bank accounts and did not increase inflation. And so we'll talk about that more uh, when we talk about inflation in a later chapter. So when a bank is making a loan, it has to balance a number of risks, right? So one of the things that is very valuable that a bank does is called maturity transformation. And basically what that means is that it takes uh, money that is short term, that people can demand back at any time, money that people put in their checking account, in their savings account, in their money market account, uh, and then it makes long term loans. So it takes these short term deposits and creates long term loans. Um, this creates a certain amount of risk, right? Because deposits can be taken out any time. Loans are much less liquid. They can't just be uh, turned into cash immediately, right? If you have a 30-year mortgage loan, you don't have to pay it back uh, except over 30 years. Um, and so the bank can't demand it right away. They could try to sell that mortgage loan to another bank, but uh, it's going to be difficult. And so that means there's a couple of types of risks that banks have to worry about. Now, the obvious risk is default risk, where people just don't pay back their loans, right? And so there's going to be different types of default risk depending on the loan. If it's a mortgage loan, the bank has the house as collateral. So if you don't pay your mortgage loan, the bank can then go take the house. On the other hand, if it's a credit card loan and you don't pay it back, then the bank can take you to court, but if you declare bankruptcy, then they're probably not going to get paid back, uh, at least in total. So there, that's why you pay a higher interest rate on credit cards than you do on mortgages, because there's a much higher default risk. And then there's also the liquidity risk, right? The fact that if depositors all want their money back at the same time, banks are not going to be able to pay them all back because they a lot of their assets are in these long-term loans. So that can lead to a banking crisis, right? And because banks make profit by lending a lot more than they hold in reserve, uh, then it can create a bank run. And this is what happened in the Great Depression in the United States, was that a lot of depositors demanded their money back at once, uh, and that could decrease the value of the assets if banks are trying to sell their assets, and a bank can go out of business, right? So. Even healthy banks can be subject to a bank run. Uh, unhealthy banks that may have made bad investments um, are very subject to bank runs. Um, and the government may intervene, especially if it's a system-wide problem, because if the whole banking system collapses, that can create additional financial problems. Um, so what we did in the United States after the Great Depression was to create deposit insurance, right? You'll see in a lot of your banking statements, hopefully all of your banking statements, it will say member FDIC. And FDIC stands for Federal Depository Insurance Corporation. And that means that if your bank goes out of business, any money that you have in your account up to $250,000 is insured. And so the FDIC usually comes in, they'll shut the bank down, they'll find another bank to merge it with, and on Monday morning, you'll get a notice that, hey, now you're now a member of this bank and your assets are safe. Sometimes banks need to borrow reserves on in the short term um, through the money market, right? And so this is a, a place where banks can uh, borrow and lend base money, what we call reserves in uh, the United States or federal funds. Um, and how much base money there is, is going to be a decision by the central bank. And that's going to influence what we'll call the policy rate. And so we'll talk about that more in the next video.